Hi, I'm Malika Bilal, and you're in the stream. How did an American missionary conduct medical work in Uganda without any qualifications? We discussed with our panelists whether some Western volunteers are doing more harm than good in the developing world. I'm Ahmed Shabaldeen. The stream, of course, is driven by you, our online community, and today's show, the story of Renee Bach, was pitched to us by Mr. Vosa. My name is Adesha Labello, Coordinating Manager for Freedom Foundation Nigeria, and you are in the stream. Renee Bach traveled to Uganda in 2007 when she was just 18 years old and founded Serving His Children, a nonprofit organization she said would help Ugandan women care for ill and malnourished kids. Critics, though, say Bach, who had no experience in either development work or medicine, performed complicated medical procedures on hundreds of youth. In 2015, Ugandan authorities closed the group's facility in the town of Jinja amid allegations of medical malpractice. But the organization still operates in other parts of the country. And Bach's case has again highlighted the issue of volunteerism, while raising questions of whether some charities in the developing world have a white savior problem. Kelsey Nielsen calls herself a white savior in recovery. Like Renee, she traveled to Uganda at a young age and shared her story with us. I had co-founded this NGO with another young white American woman. Both of us were fresh out of undergraduate school and we both came from an evangelical background and had access to funding from our churches and from people in the church community. So. It was not that we were more qualified or that we were actually the best fit to be in charge or to be co-founding this, but because we had the power and privilege to do so. If there's anything that we as foreign nationals need to do moving forward, it is to remain accountable to the people in the country and cultures we're working in. We need to be held accountable. We need to own up when we make mistakes and we need to commit to doing better. A lawsuit brought against serving his children has been adjourned until January 2020. And joining us now from Kampala to help unpack the story, Alasso Olivia Patience is the co-founder of the education and advocacy group No White Saviors. Also in Kampala, Beatrice Kayaga is a legal officer with the Women's Pro Bono Initiative, a group working on behalf of two Ugandan mothers who say their children were among the many who reportedly died under box care. And in the U.S. state of Illinois, Dr. Noel Sullivan is a medical anthropologist. Now, the stream did invite serving his children to participate in this conversation, but the group said, quote, we are not commenting or responding to questions. So welcome, everyone, to the program. I'll start here with the headline. This from the news and advance an, ex, an ordinary girl who said yes to an extraordinary God. Bedford native finds home in Uganda. And this came out September 26, 2017. Olivia, for those who aren't familiar with this story, what stands out to you the most about Renee Bach's story? Um, I think, um, thank you very much. Um, what stands out on this story is the fact that um, someone with no medical qualification would come to a country like Uganda and treat our children and then relate it to being a call from God. This is so dangerous and it is happening in, in, in the in the missionary world as well. It is it is all about God. It is God who sends people to Africa. And most of the time I ask myself this question, when is God going to send the African people to America or any part of Europe to, to go on these missions? Um, this story is really striking to me because um, this woman knew very well she had no medical qualifications, but she turned the Ugandan children into... Um, bodies to experiment on. Uh, she didn't, um, she, much as she's always saying that she, she wanted good for these children, she would have got trained medical doctors to handle these children. But even the fact that she was seeing them die, she was not stopping. She was not stopping to do this. Mm -hmm. So this is so striking in my mind. I, it gives me so many questions on, um, on what people who come to Africa really take Africans for. And also, 
um, what comes to my mind is that people have taken Africa to be an experimental ground where you can come and do anything and walk away and go without anyone holding you accountable. Mm -hmm. This is a woman who is sitting freely in the United States after committing such, such things on our children. But come to think of it, if it was a black woman who went to the U.S. or any part of Europe and did this, they'll be in jail right now. Mm -hmm. But it, it because of the white privilege that this woman is now free and, and she feels that whatever she did was right and we deserve that. Mm -hmm. Our children mm -hmm. deserve that. Olivia, strong start to this conversation. So I want to bring in the voice uh, via uh, another publication here and this is of renee who of course uh, did not respond to our calls to appear on the show and speak for herself so this is a quote um, in which she says the allegations that over a thousand children died under my care is absolute lies and allegations i can't rule out the fact that children died like they do die in any health facility but still it's not true to say that i killed them so much to unpack right there, Beatrice. What do we know about her patients and alleged victims? Um, thank you so much. Uh, right now, the victims uh, were identified. However, we're able to trace only a few. And it does not take away the fact that their main issue we are going to court was that uh, Rennie, while passing off as a medical doctor, it is alleged that she led them to believe that her, her facility is a medical is a medical hospital where people can go and get treatment. However, the people, as much as the people were ignorant about the fact that she was not uh, facilitated or trained or license to carry out medical treatment for the children, we still go to court on those issues. Mm -hmm. So we have the mothers identified and also the children identified mm -hmm. as died okay. as a result of, of, of that uh, negligence in other facilities. You know, it's interesting. Uh, we have so many comments about this issue. It's obviously something people are very passionate about. In fact, on YouTube Live, we have uh, Ethic Ethnic saying, there are a lot of well-meaning white folks in aid, but aid keeps countries poor. And it's always funny how TV commercials tell you a country's poor, but never mention why it's poor, colonialism. And uh, if I may, Dr. Noel, I want to actually uh, bring up a conversation that people are having online, H.G. Flores trying to empathize perhaps with Renee, saying, I believe the issue may be twofold. Renee Bach may be guilty of practicing health care without a license and as such could be responsible for the unintended consequences. Number two, the group No White Saviors are using this case to push the narrative white people only hurt black people. And <clears throat> forgive me for bringing this last tweet in, but it's interesting to see the response. Like it speaks volumes that you try to tone down what Renee did, hundreds of kids are dead, and you're treating it like a mistake. Um, Dr. Noel, I'm curious for your thoughts uh, both on the idea of colonialism and how that might factor into the emotionality of this, but also that debate that played out right there. So this is sort of indicative of the kinds of discourses that happen every time white savior complex is brought up in the media. We've had a lot of really good examples of that over the last year. And ultimately, it ends up being a case where it's about people's emotional experience of feeling like they're getting critiqued for power dynamics that they are in, complicit in, but don't necessarily see how they're complicit in. And so in terms of colonialism, for instance, to, to respond to mm -hmm. um, what was said, that's very much a case of what's going on today in that a lot of the governments that are supporting different types of aid strategies they're supporting things like HIV or malaria or reproductive health, but they're never actually accountable to the people they're helping. The people that are being helped don't have a say in the kinds of help that is being rendered. And a lot of that aid has ended up undermining the health systems and education systems that they're purporting to assist. Uh, and the same is true of the NGO world. So it's a very valid critique in that the people that are supposed to be helped are not the people who get to have a real true say 
in terms of what kind of help is rendered. And there's very little possibility to render accountability um, for any kinds of unintended consequences for the actions of large development organizations as well as individuals. There's nothing new about people with no medical training going from the United States or Canada or Australia or other countries in Europe or elsewhere even to uh, go and help in hospitals or to go start their own clinics. This is something that I've been researching since 2011, and it's very common. Um, and there's a sense that the people that are going are, are sort of socialized from an early age to think, I'm supposed to give back, I am supposed to help, it's my obligation, but also later, it's my right to do that. Mm -hmm. And then they go, and oftentimes, if they're working side by side with uh, professionals, certified professionals in the countries where they're working, they mm -hmm. often unsee that expertise that the people have in order to construct a narrative in which they're the only ones available to help. And we see that very clearly mm -hmm. in Renee's case as well, that other people weren't helping, they didn't have the ability to help, so I stepped in even though I don't right. have those certifications. So the idea of constructing a narrative, of course, is one that strikes a chord online. Uh, before I dip into some of that, we received mm -hmm. a comment from a former employee of Sir Serving his children, and he told the stream about the alleged practices that happened under Renee Bach's watch. So have a look. By the time I was, I started working at serving his children. There were some doctors who were trying to collect children to prescribe medicine, but uh, see Renee used to go ahead and cancel what the doctors have prescribed. Because one, at one point, I approached one of the doctors who passed away called Dr. Ibra. And Dr. Ibra told me that, you know, a boss is a boss. However much is on uh, wrong, is ever, they, over, they, they are ever right. So Dr. Ibra told me that uh, for them, they go ahead and prescribe medicine. Then for us, she cancels and consults other doctors who are outside the country. And for his safety, uh, and, and, and because he lives there, he asked us not to show his face, so he recorded that, and we used the audio from it. So in it, he says that Rene would cancel what local doctors would prescribe, and when other doctors were asked about this, they said, well, a boss is a boss. She's the boss. What are you going to do? So take a look here. This via Instagram, good white person syndrome. <laughs> the persistent and insistent, incessant need for us white people to prove that we are not a part of the problem. To den deny our implicit role in perpetuating racism and white supremacy. Uh, this manifests itself in gaslighting, white tears, fragility, and the white savior complex. And, and this is posted by your co-founder, who we heard at the top of the show, Olivia, um, Kelsey, mm. who says, I'm a resident white savior in recovery. Talk to us about this hashtag, this account. Where did it get started? Uh, well, um, thank you very much. Um, this started from Ginger. I grew up in Ginger. And Ginger is like the epic center of white saviorism. There's so many white people in Ginger. They love Ginger. And because Ginger is a, a quiet town, anyone can do anything and just walk away. And, and no one is going to really monitor what you do. So I walked... Um, um, alongside grow up in, growing up in Ginger, I worked in the NGO world in Ginger. I worked uh, with Kelsey Nelson in Ginger, and uh, I saw so much happening in Ginger. I saw adoption. I saw um, so much that needed to unpack. But then there was no way I would start up and, you know, discuss this alone. So when I resigned from my job where I was working, and I resigned because there was this terrible white girl who was treating Ugandans poorly. And I saw that there was no way I was going to work with her and I was going to listen to whatever she was going to tell me. So I quit my job. And when oh. I quit my job, um, I stayed in contact with... Um, with Kelsey Nelson and another team member of the No White Savior called Sharon. And we continued to discuss this. And I continued to point out that there was something going on and the world needed to know and we needed to address it. So we started with conversations on Facebook and then we started the hashtag No White Saviors. But everyone had their own to say uh, because they had seen so much. Kelsey stayed for some time in Ginger, 
and she was part of this community. She at that time she was part of the problem. That's why she oh. says white savior in, in recovery because she was part of the problem, and she will still be part of this problem. So um, this is how we came about with this hashtag, and we say that the world actually needs to know the truth of what happens mm -hmm. in the NGO world because so many people who are working in the NGO world cannot say this. That's right. Every, no one wants right. to lose right. their job. And and, and I appreciate your passion, and I just want to say that it's being mirrored online. Uh, you know, I always love when people are commenting in real time and, and in fact, responding to what we're saying on air. HG Flores responding to both me and uh, the earlier tweet I read, saying, I'm not treating it like a mistake. If she practiced medicine without a license, she did it intentionally and as such could be charged with medical malpractice. But um, I want to bring kind of a different angle to the conversation very quickly. Uh, Kyle William yeah. Marston, who is very active in our community here at the stream, uh, chiming in, you know, we asked a question on Twitter, do you think there's a way to be there on the ground and not exploit um, what's happening? He says, I sure hope so, otherwise I've been part of the problem. He goes on to say, people need to be more aware of this, especially before they go abroad. And this I found quite telling. It's hard not to feel like a rock star when you are the only white person in a 20 kilometer radius, especially if you're there for a while which I don't know if he intended it that way, but can be problematic in of itself. Um, and it's just very interesting, Doctor, I, you know, I see Beatrice, you're nodding, but um, Noelle, I'm curious, you know, Eddie on, on Twitter saying, look, I've also been there, I tried to be a solution, but I was the white privileged class. I've never been the privileged class, except when I was in Africa, I tried to assimilate, I had empathy, I had many great experiences, and I had a return ticket back to wherever I came from. So obviously being aware and being candid and honest is important, but what else is important in solving this? Well, I think just taking away the ownership from the people that are going there to supposedly save uh, people that they know nothing about. And instead, I think there's a lot of things that could be done, but I find that when people go, they tend to really favor the kind of assistance that they can provide with their own two hands. And to realize with some humility that that's not necessarily the most appropriate or helpful thing. And if you don't actually have certified professional skills that are being demanded or asked for by the community, that you might be part of the problem despite your intentions. So what I tell people is, you know, good intentions are step one of a multi-step process. And step two should always be to try to talk to people in the community to find out what it is that they're trying to achieve for themselves. What are their goals? Humbly ask how you can assist and realize the assistance you can render may not be with your own two hands. It might actually be about mobilizing resources, including monetary resources or other types of capacities uh, to be able to assist with the stated needs of the communities where you're working. And if you're not doing that, then it might be part of the problem. Mm -hmm. And that could potentially cause harm. And a lot of the harm that's rendered, those people that go on short-term visits never understand because they don't stay long enough to see the long-term repercussions of what they do. Mm -hmm. I want to make clear that, of course, this is not just one story. This is not just about Renee Buck mm -hmm. in particular. And as you mentioned yeah. earlier, uh, Dr. Noel, you said this is nothing new. So I want to share with our audience how not new this really is. So this from Nairobi News. American man claims innocence on charges of molesting orphan Kenyan girls. That's one story there. This from the Washington Post. An American pastor reportedly gave miracle water to Ugandans. <laughs> it was bleach. Uh, the embassy actually weighed in on that U.S. mission in Uganda. The U.S. mission is aware of reports that an American pastor based remotely is distributing a substance called miracle mineral solution to churches in Uganda. We strongly condemn the distribution of this substance, which is extremely dangerous and is not a cure for any disease. So of course, we are talking about individuals here, uh, Olivia, but we got this tweet from Always Somewhere who says, I hope UNICEF, UNICEF chief, UN Human Rights, Amnesty, Human Rights Watch, all take note of it. So we're talking about individuals, but what is the role of big aid in this? Um, I think um, um, actually uh, the role of big aid in this is that um, we see this, we see the breakdown of aid when it comes to Africa. And this, in most cases, this aid comes with strings attached. If a big organization is trying to help up on a mission in Africa, they will create, um, they'll create positions They'll create positions for their people, even when they know that this person is not fit 
you know, that is how aid now is dangerous when it comes here. It is not targeting the employment of locals, but it is looking at their own who are on the top, they're on the top positions. And when it comes to Ugandans, they have to scope the law positions and they have to be paid um, a, a wage that is not equivalent to that of the expatriates. But when you come to think of the expatriates, what work are they doing that Ugandans like or that, African Bella. nationals cannot do? You know, mm -hmm. so uh, when we look at aid, um, aid flowing into Uganda or into any part of Africa, there's always some strings attached. And it's not only today. Mm -hmm. Look at um, it's, it's not just coming now. It has been there for ages. Mm -hmm. We had recently um, an encounter with Comic Relief when they sent a British celebrity mm -hmm. to Uganda. She took pictures with this child that she didn't know about. And um, Comic Relief first denied the allegation, but thank God that uh, Daily Mail flew in Uganda and went to this family and got the facts. You know, and then later it comes out that she didn't have any connection. But because Uganda needs the aid, anyone can walk here, take a picture and go away. And no one is going to talk about it right. because we need the aid. Right. So we well, should well, look at the way this aid comes in. Well, you know, just hearing you say that, Olivia, you're saying we need the aid. And the mentality obviously is important to analyze and look at on both sides of this equation or all sides, I should say. Uh, and Sifiso Sonika on Twitter saying, our governments are allowing this nonsense because they still believe in this white savior mentality. This NGO are using our people to enrich themselves. Um, we also had a video comment come in that was very interesting, kind of um, you know, focusing on a different angle in terms of not necessarily defending NGOs and big aid in general, but have a listen to uh, what was said. We'll talk on the other side. It's important to recognize that in many places where national governments lack the capacity to address urgent healthcare needs, NGOs play an absolutely vital role in filling those gaps. And while it's difficult to generalize about them because of disparities in terms of their capabilities or, or their agendas, most are staffed by highly qualified professionals, many of whom are volunteers, and they're expected to oh, adhere to yeah, international norms and codes of conduct. The humanitarian sector has yeah, well, taken steps to professionalize aid yeah. work and fair. improve accountability, but these sorts of cases just highlight how much there is yet to be done. Noel, that was a doctor from Ireland. I'm just curious your thoughts on that perspective. Well, I think he's got a really important point to make, but on the flip side, I think that Olivia made a really important point that sort of gels well with that one, which is that and it's not just that the governments, he's talking about filling a gap, that the NGOs are filling a gap, but at what point do the NGOs also have an obligation to actually bolster the capacity of the health systems in the places where they work? And the other thing that most people don't realize about the aid sector is that NGOs coming in as well as bilateral mm -hmm. donors, a lot of times they get tax exemptions in the countries where they're working. So while you may actually have qualified Ugandan uh, or, or other uh, professionals that are able to work in that capacity, those folks also pay taxes, which helps to provide revenue for the government to bolster those systems. And they're mm -hmm. supposed to be accountable right. to their people. And if they're not, the citizens are responsible for holding their governments accountable. There's no accountability for an NGO sector that isn't necessarily doing that or maybe duplicating or replicating that work. And we have decades of research demonstrating and, and accountability, that duplication is And accountability is always a problem. Uh, Beatrice, I, I, I want to bring Beatrice yeah. back in because we reconnected on the phone. Very quickly, Beatrice, I pulled up this here. Woman sued over death of babies, faking qualification. Of course, that is Renee. Where is the lawsuit now? And just about a sentence or two. Yes, uh, the case is uh, in the High Court of Ginger, and it is up for hearing on 21st January 2020. However, right now we are in the preliminary stages of a suit where we are responding uh, to, the, to, to the replies that were given to us by res the respondents. And they have been very cooperative to send us th their responses to our allegations. And we believe that by, the, by 2020, it will be heard fully and everyone will get the judgment. Mm. Beatrice Kayaga, Olivia Patience, and Dr. Noel Sullivan, thank you so much for joining us. That's all the time we have for today's discussion. But thanks, of course, to our community for pitching this and keep the conversation going online. Following us on Twitter, we are at AJStream. Ahmed and I will see you next time.